No matter if you are pro-guns or anti-guns, one thing all Americans can agree on is that the USA has a gun violence problem. Do we need stricter gun laws? And do they really infringe on the Second Amendment rights? Or is it just all made up shit and propaganda that has been fed to us by a specific organization to take control over the business of guns? Breaking news, a horrific scene in Texas. A gunman opens fire at an elementary school, killing 14 students and one teacher after he shot and killed his grandmother. This morning, chilling new details on how the gunman behind the deadly mass shooting at a Buffalo, New York supermarket plotted his racist rampage. We're following some breaking news out of California now. Authorities have just identified the man accused of shooting one person to death and injuring five others inside a church. Comparing to the previous year, the number of active shooters are up 50% and then 97% from 2017. Many critics are directing their anger at the National Rifle Association, which has long opposed many gun reforms as infringing on the Second Amendment. As of today, at the time of recording this video, there have been 230 mass shootings in the USA just this year. If that's not shocking enough, as of now, this year alone, there have been 17,910 people killed due to gun violence in the USA. 150 of them have been children under the age of 11 and 529 have been kids between the ages of 12 and 17. Gun violence in this country is a problem and most of the developed world does not understand this American gun culture. There is so much complexity than just the Second Amendment. There's one specific organization which is controlling everything and has been for years. That is what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. And I wanted to get your opinion, whether it's from USA or from Europe as well. If you are new here, I am Jay and my other half is Stefan. Half of the year we live here in Southern California and the other half we live in Germany. The problem we have with guns in the USA is that most people do not know the whole truth of how this business of guns is played out in the USA. They only know what they see on media. But there's so much more underneath the covers that most Americans don't know about. Most Americans don't know who controls this who creates this propaganda and who benefits from this and how it influences so much of what has been going on politically for decades. Most Americans and most people around the world are unaware of the depths of this organization who is controlling the American politics and has been and specifically controlling part of the Republican Party and gun culture for well over 50 years. By now, most of the world watching the news would have heard of an organization called the NRA, National Rifle Association. But what exactly is the NRA? Why are they so influential and powerful? How do they make their money, which then they use to control a lot of the things that are going on for years? And why don't they pay taxes? Let's discuss all these questions today. So a little history, NRA was established in 1871, a few years after the Civil War, to train hunters and marksmen on gun use and safety. And at first, when the NRA was established, it cooperated with the federal government on concealed weapon permits and other laws regulating firearms. And for most of the 20th century, the NRA supported laws in favor of gun control. The NRA even helped President Franklin Roosevelt draft the first gun control laws. And at that time, the NRA president, in a testimony before Congress, said that, um, I quote, 
I do not believe in the general promiscuous toting of guns. I think it should be sharply restricted and only under licenses. It continued on for years without any major issues until the assassination of US President John F. Kennedy in 1963. And soon after his assassination, a ban on mail order guns sales was discussed but it didn't really go into effect. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the NRA fully supported this ban on mail order sales. The vice president of the NRA then said, we do not think that any sane American who calls himself an American can object to placing into this bill, the instrument which killed the president of the United States. So again, the NRA was fully on board with gun control and so was most of America. On April 4th, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And then in the same year, on June 5th, 1968, Robert Kennedy was assassinated with a 22 caliber pistol. So all these assassination shifted the American attitude towards gun ownership. And then the efforts to pass the Gun Control Act of then 1968 came into play. Again, the NRA was fully on board with this act. But this time, it was a little bit different for the NRA. They were pulled into uh, this a little bit more politically than they ever had been before. So after when the Gun Control Act went into full effect on October 22nd, it basically banned mail order sales of rifles, shotguns, and prohibiting most felons drug users, and people found mentally incompetent from buying guns. And soon after this, the NRA kind of started to change their tune. The NRA started to shift its focus from recreational hunting to guns rights activism because they saw an opportunity and they basically took it. And with this opportunity, they started to create fear amongst the public that the government's gun control laws infringe on the Second Amendment, completely contradicting the stance that they just had taken. They basically did a complete 180. By the 1990s, the NRA had transformed itself into a politicized gun lobby. In 1994, President Bill Clinton put into effect the 1994 assault weapons ban. The bill banned more than a dozen specific firearms and certain features on guns. Following this year, in 1995, the NRA claimed that the 1994 assault weapons ban gives government more power to take away our constitutional rights. And they labeled the American government as thugs. Again, creating fear amongst the people that their Second Amendment rights were in danger. Then during this time, NRA also recruited Charlton Heston, and he was paid heavily by the NRA to represent them. The NRA also became highly involved with the far right movement. They became one of the biggest financial supporters of the Republican Party, but not the entire Republican Party. Only candidates which were far right and supported the NRA agenda and propaganda. Let's go back to Charlton Heston. If you're not familiar with him, he was a well-known Hollywood celebrity um, who's been in blockbuster films such as, I believe, Ben-Hur and um, Planet of the Apes. In 1998, Charlton Heston was voted NRA's president and he served until 2003. In 2000, at the NRA convention, he delivered a chilling speech which resonated with pro-gun Americans and feared by the rest. For everyone within the sound of my voice, to hear and to heed, and especially for you, Mr. Gore. Holding a replica of a colonial musket over his head, he said divisive forces would have to take his gun from his cold, dead hands. From my cold, dead hands. And then in 2002, an American filmmaker who's known to do controversial documentaries interviewed Charlton Heston in his Beverly Hills home. Moore asks Heston if he has guns in the house. You have guns in the house here? Indeed I do. Uh-huh. And Bad guys take notice. <laughs> <laughs> so you have them for protection? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been a victim of crime? No, no. And he admits that yes, he does, and they are actually loaded. Never, never, yeah, never been assaulted or uh, no, no violence uh, toward you. Or, but you have guns in the house. Uh, loaded, have, loaded, they're loaded. Yeah. This is where it gets interesting because more drills into him, which 
most of the responsible Americans have an issue with is why would anyone have a loaded gun unless there was an absolute need for it? And Hester responds, as do most Americans having loaded guns in their homes, is that it's for protection. Well, but let me ask you, you really thing. need a weapon for, for self-defense, you need it loaded. Moore goes on to ask him, why can't he just unload the guns? Because obviously he doesn't need the protection right now. He doesn't have any reason to fear anything. No one has threatened him. So why does he have a loaded gun? And why can't he just keep an unloaded gun in the house and he receives a very typical answer that he has a right to do this because of his Second Amendment rights. Why, why don't you unload the gun? Because uh, um, the Second Amendment gives me the right to have it loaded. And then Heston goes on to contradict himself in nearly every sentence. And he goes on further to say that he's practicing his right, which was passed down to him from his white old dead guys who invented this country. I'm exercising one of the rights uh, passed on down to me from those wise old dead white guys that invented this country. Wow. <laughs> I like these words kind of made me laugh. And then Moore goes on to explain that he can still practice his right, but he can have the guns locked away and basically be more responsible. And Hester's response again is very typical. Just by having the gun unloaded and locked away somewhere. I choose to have it. He does this because he chooses to, because he can. Moore then goes on to talk about the gun violence and the gun murder rate in other first world countries like Germany, like Canada. I think American history is, uh, has a lot of blood on his hands. This is what most people in America who are extremely pro-gun believe. And I also think most Americans that are, are so blindly pro-gun um, kind of forget or they twist and turn their understanding of the Second Amendment. If you really look at the history of the Second Amendment, why it was put into play, which I won't discuss today, but uh, maybe I should in a different video just focus on Second Amendment. It wasn't so anyone and whoever could own a gun for any reason and, you know, carry a gun everywhere they go and protect their neighbor and this and that. It was for an issue far bigger than this. So Heston has no answer to this, but Moore pushes him and this is what he has to say. You don't have any opinion though as to why that is that we are the unique country, the only country that does this, that kills each other on this level with guns. Well, we have probably a more mixed ethnicity. Wow, so now the guns are needed for protection because the mix of ethnicity, because that clearly is a cause of violence and that we must protect ourselves from other races than our own. That really makes sense. This is so unfucking believable to me that this came out of an adult man let alone Charlton Heston. The funny thing to add here is that before Heston was bought out by the NRA, he was a firm supporter of the civil rights movement. He was a supporter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all of his works. He also was a firm supporter of the Gun Control Act of 1968. It was not until the mid 70s and especially in the 80s when he was recruited by the Republican Party as an advocate. That is when he changed his perception. He then became heavily involved with the NRA. Over the course of years since the NRA's political involvement after the Gun Control Act of 1968, the NRA engaged more and more in the American politics. They used the politics to gain advancement in the business of guns. They slowly became a protection racket. For anyone who is not familiar with the term protection racket, a protection racket is a criminal system of taking money from people in exchange for agreeing not to hurt them or damage their property. Now, that is in the traditional sense. And if you see some of the older movies with mafia and whatever, so you kind of get to see what a protection racket is. In a modern day, NRA is the protection racket, but 
kind of like behind the scenes. The NRA became highly influential in the Republican Party by paving the path with money, by helping defeat people both in Republican and Democratic parties which opposed gun control and promising a solid political future with monetary gains for candidates which supported the NRA agenda. In a very eye-opening piece written by Richard Painter, you should check it out if you have the time, he wrote this in 2012 and in that he says, the message to the Republicans is clear. We will help you get elected and protect your seat from Democrats. We will spend millions on ads that make your opponent look worse than the average holdup man robbing a liquor store. In return, we expect you to oppose any laws that regulate guns. These include laws requiring handgun registration, meaningful background checks on purchasers, limiting the right to carry concealed weapons, limiting access to semi-automatic weapons, or anything else that would diminish the firepower available to anybody who wants it. And if you don't comply, we will load our weapons and direct everything in our arsenal at you in the next Republican primary. Just as I was organizing this video, the NRA tweeted this. President Donald Trump says, it's time for highly trained teachers to be allowed to carry concealed firearms to protect children at schools. We're going from a first world country to a hoodlum country where now you're promoting teachers to carry guns in schools? That doesn't make any sense at all. But now the question is, how does the NRA get all this money that they then use to push their agenda and control some of the key Republican candidates? The NRA is a nonprofit, which essentially means that they do not pay taxes at all. The millions of dollars that they receive are all tax-free. The biggest portion of their revenue is from programs and services. These include hunting training or law enforcement training. But the second largest revenue comes from donations and contributions. One member in particular, he was interviewed in 2005 and he had donated $50,000 from the year 2005 and then onwards for the course of 11 years. Um, but when asked, he admitted that it is a good percentage of my income, but I want to do everything I can easily to preserve my freedoms. And to me, when I hear this, I find it very sad that the NRA is obviously taking advantage of American citizens by by creating all this fear that they're going to lose their freedom and then these people shell out money thinking that the NRA is actually protecting their freedom, but they're really not. Now, what do they do with all this money? A huge part of this money is distributed, distributed to the key employees and officers. Here you can see that over $2.1 million is distributed to the CEO. Nearly $1.4 million is distributed to the president and nearly $1.3 million is distributed to the executive director. Then there are other contributions labeled as other salaries and other wages, other employee benefits and pension plans, sucking the money and livelihood of so many people for their personal benefits. So anyone who's watching who is a member of the NRA here in the USA and who is very pro-NRA, do you really think this fair for the NRA as a nonprofit organization to collect people's money and pay themselves these high salaries, benefits, and pension plans? The NRA is not your friend, no matter which side of gun control you are on. The NRA uses its narrative politically because that is how they have divided this country. If you oppose them, they vilify you. They discredit anyone who is in their way. They have created a regime based on us versus them. They use the American freedoms, the Second Amendment, and the fear of losing it to control the citizens of this beautiful country. The truth is that gun control has been a part of the USA for a very long time, without ever it being an issue. The Second Amendment was not created so anyone and everyone could buy a gun and carry a gun and kill anyone. It was created to protect the free state, for the government to rely on an organized militia 
when and if a need occurred. Thank you guys so much for watching. I would love to hear your thoughts, your opinions on this topic in the comments below. And as always, I will see you in the comments. Thank you.